Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this community briefing on COVID-19 and our community's response effort. Joining me again is interpreter Margie Prop. Thank you so much, Margie, for joining. And thank you to you for tuning in to this briefing and to the media for helping us to relay important public health messages. We want to remind everyone to please visit our website, covid19.lincoln.ne.gov, where you can continue to find out more information about our local cases and investigations and how you can protect yourself, your loved ones, and our community during this pandemic. We are opening this briefing today with deep regret about the loss of another member of our community who has passed away from COVID-19. That brings our total death toll in Lancaster County to four. The state is reporting a total of 103 people lost to COVID-19. And again, these are much more than numbers. They are beloved family members and coworkers, friends and neighbors. On behalf of the city of Lincoln, I offer condolences to all those in our community who are in mourning here in Lancaster County and across the state and country. Today in Lincoln, we report an additional 23 individuals who have tested positive for COVID-19. The total number of lab confirmed cases in Lincoln now stands at 688. Here to share more details about the health department's investigations of these cases is health department director, Pat Lopez. Good afternoon. Our 27 active contact tracers are continuing their investigations. The largest area of concern remains the Smithfield plant in Crete in the neighboring Saline County. Our contact tracers investigations have now identified 244 Lancaster County residents who are positive cases related to the plant, 154 employees at the plant, and 88 are family members or other direct contacts and two cases are still being investigated. The cases related to the Smithfield plan in Crete represent 35% of all lab confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Lancaster County. We have no new cases to report at the smaller Smithfield plant in Lincoln or Smart Chicken in Waverly. Bryan Health and CHI St. Elizabeth completed 423 tests at their various testing sites. Those include the hospitals and the drive through sites. Again, if you have symptoms of COVID-19, we urge you to get tested now. Please visit chihealth.com or bryanhealth.com to begin the process. Test Nebraska is also testing in Lincoln as well. For more information on that testing option, you can visit testnebraska, all one word, .com. The overall positivity rate for Lancaster County is down from 9.8% yesterday to 9.4% today. The state rate is 17.8% and the national rate is 17%. Today our local hospitals report 39 COVID positive uh, patients. That includes 17 from Lancaster County and 22 from other parts of the state. Nine of the patients are on ventilators, and that includes three from Lancaster County and six from other parts of the state. Our hospital capacity in Lincoln remains healthy. As we share data with you about the cases of COVID-19 in our community, we must be very careful to protect the identity of those who have contracted the virus. We need to have enough data to make sure that individuals cannot be identified by the information we are sharing. We are now at the point with information that we can share about adding race and ethnicity to our information on our online dashboard. Today, we are also adding recovery information to the dashboard. Getting this data involves follow-up with all of the previous positive cases to conduct an epidemiological interview with each person to review their case and determine if they have recovered. Our lead health department epidemiologist, Raju Karkapuludi, is here to share that information about this data and the update to the data dashboard. Uh, thank you, Pat. Thank you, Mayor. I'm Raju Kakarlapudi, public health epidemiologist for Lincoln-Lancaster County Health Department. 
We are pleased to announce these enhancements to COVID-19 data dashboard. This dashboard is updated every afternoon with the latest information for Lancaster County. I want to thank our epidemiology team, information management team, and our GIS team for their help in putting this application together. I will talk first about the new information on recoveries. You will find the number right below the total number of cases and deaths on the right. People are considered to be recovered if they have two consecutive lab-confirmed negative tests or if they are symptom-free for 28 days after the first onset of symptoms. We have public health nurses following up with all the positive cases that have reached the 28-day mark. This takes time, but so far we have, they have been able to determine that 63 people can be designated as recovered. We expect that number to continue to rise considerably as more individuals reach the 28-day mark and as we have time to conduct more investigations. The race and ethnicity information is now on the top left portion of the dashboard. As Pat mentioned, we are able to report this data now that we have sufficient number of cases to ensure their privacy. You can see the highest percentage is 33.2% for our Asian community. This is concerning because Asian individuals make up just 4% of our county's population. The percentage of Hispanic individuals is 23.9, and again, this is concerning because they make up just 7.2% of our county's population. The percentage of cases for black or African American individuals is 7.6%. This population makes up 3.9% of our county's population. You can also see that white individuals make up just 30.7% of the cases, but they represent 85.6% of county's population. Thank you. Thank you, Raju and Director Lopez. These numbers tell a heartbreaking story. They vividly illustrate the disparities in how members of our community are experiencing this pandemic. These disparities across race and ethnicity are deeply troubling, and we know that they do not exist in a vacuum. We know that they reflect similar trends in diagnosed cases in other communities nationally, and that they are part, in part the result of generations of structural inequality in our society. So this data now makes clear that racial and ethnic disparities in health outcomes in Lincoln that have long existed are becoming more pronounced as a result of this virus which is why having access to this demographic data and providing it to our community is vitally important. In order to effectively address these disparities, we must do everything we can to understand what those disparities are, where they are, and why they exist. While we may never fully understand all of the reasons for these disparities, there are a number of factors that likely contribute to different health outcomes. Those include existing disparities in the rates of chronic illness and chronic health and con conditions that increase the risk of complications from COVID-19. They include differences in access to basic needs like nutritious food and health care and safe, stable housing. And they also could be attributed in part to the increased likelihood of racial minorities to be employed as frontline workers during this pandemic. We also know that access to information about this virus can be a tremendous barrier for those in our community who do not speak English. Our goal is to reach every resident with the most accurate and timely information to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and to keep everyone in Lincoln safe. The data we have available as of today reaffirms how important it is for us to continue to invest in targeted outreach to communities disproportionately impacted by the virus. This means we will remain committed to providing translation and interpretation of important public health messages. We will continue to work in partnership with the Lincoln Community Foundation to provide resources to agencies who support frontline workers, individuals who are newly vulnerable as a result of the pandemic, 
and to racial and ethnic minorities through the COVID-19 Response Fund. And we will continue to work with healthcare system to provide free testing to those who need it. As one example of these efforts, this Friday, the Health Department, the Cultural Center Coalition, and Bryan Health are partnering to provide an additional COVID-19 testing opportunity specifically for those served by cultural centers. Those experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 can register in advance through their cultural center or through our health department hotline at 402-441-8006. The testing will take place from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. at Lincoln High School, again, this Friday, May 15th, in the, in the uh, south parking lot. Interpreters will be available to assist those whose primary language is not English. We will continue to do all of this and more because this data isn't just data, and these numbers aren't just numbers to us. They are people. They are people who call Lincoln home, people we care deeply about, and people who make this city great. Next, we want to update you on some of the ways our city operations are being affected by the pandemic. On March 11th, we announced, along with the Nebraska State Athletic Association officials, the restriction of attendance at the Boys State Basketball Tournament in Lincoln. It was among the very first big decisions that we made to help prevent spread of COVID-19 and that had a significant impact on our local economy. Now, 63 days later, we know that every institution, organization, business, and employer in our city has been affected in some way by the economic disruption caused by COVID-19. And of course, the city of Lincoln, our organization, is no exception. My administration is preparing to submit a recommendation to the city council for the next budget cycle. And at the same time, we are making some hard decisions to address a significant shortfall in sales tax for the current budget year. Last year, sales tax made up 47% of our general fund revenue. The general fund is important. It finances the day-to-day -day operation of basic governmental activities and services, such as police and fire protection, emergency communications, legal services, aging services, planning and development, and parks and recreation. We are preparing for these potential shortfalls, but the actual impact at this point still remains uncertain. Reports on impacted sales tax will not be received until mid-May for the March numbers and mid-June for the April numbers. However, our current estimates for the year, fiscal year 1920 sales tax revenue is 74, a little over $74 million, which is $5,288,551 short of the budgeted amount of $79,516,488. For this projection, the city is estimating a 16% drop in sales tax revenue in May and August and a 40% drop for June and July. In addition to these shortfalls in sales tax, uh, we are anticipating major reductions to interest earnings, parking revenue, gas taxes, recreation receipts, and a number of other core revenues for this current fiscal year. The one indicator we do have hard numbers for is occupation tax. We saw an average of a 32% drop in occupation tax revenue for March, and occupation tax represents 17% of our normal sales tax collections. Occupation tax on food and restaurants, hotels, car rentals, for example. In the upcoming budget, we had anticipate additional decreases in revenue for taxes to support 911 as landline decrease, declines in federal grant support for things other than COVID-19, Parking revenue declines down by 80 to 90 percent due to COVID, a 70 percent decrease in Keno funds, EMS revenue declines due to COVID, gas tax declines due to COVID, significant revenue declines to StarTran due to decreased ridership, free fare operations, and university route cancellations, and declines in library fines and fees. All of the sources of revenue fund all of the sources of revenue fund overall operations of the city and support city staff and salaries. Our upcoming gap for the next budget cycle is estimated to be $17 million in year one and as high as $22 million in year two. So it's not a pretty picture we have to offer right now. We understand that changes to our operations and potential service cuts are real possibilities. 
At the same time, we also view these decisions through the lens of a major employer. The city of Lincoln has over 2,000 employees who provide for their families and contribute to our economy. We do not take the responsibility of crafting our budget lightly. And that's why when the pandemic arose in an effort to keep our employees safe, healthy, and working, and to support city employees facing health and family challenges caused by COVID-19, the city instituted a temporary telework policy and procedure which facilitated suitable positions for work from home and kept our employees working. We implemented a new temporary paid leave benefit for our employees, the Paid Pandemic Leave Program. Under this program, the city provided up to two weeks of paid leave to city employees, which was over and above the two weeks of paid leave provided by the Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act. This week, I signed an executive order to take additional steps to respond to the budgetary challenges for this fiscal year. We've implemented a hiring freeze except for critical city positions. City employee out of tra town travel has been suspended. Capital spending reductions are being pursued. Internal transfers and rate holidays are being enacted to replenish the general fund and to strengthen our cash position going into the next budget year. I'm deeply grateful to our department directors who are innovating and reviewing their operations to help us solve this unique challenge. And we will solve this challenge together. And now we're gonna to turn to some good news. We wanna thank KLIN's Jack Mitchell, who is doing an unusual fundraiser today for our Lincoln COVID-19 response fund. Uh, Jack occasionally makes ill-advised bets on when winter will be over, and when he loses that bet, he embarks on his now infamous walk of shame. This year's walk is a bit different, however. Uh, with so many people following the guidance of health professionals and staying home, Jack is doing a virtual walk in his basement. He started at 8.30 a.m. and plans to go until sometime later this evening. When I spoke with him earlier today, he had 16 miles under his belt. And of course, if you want to support his efforts, you can donate at any time to our fund, the, COVID, the Lincoln COVID-19 Response Fund at lcf.org. So far, this fund has raised over a million dollars and has granted $729,000 to local nonprofits that serve those who are disproportionately impacted by this virus. Thank you to Jack and thank you to all who are supporting this great cause. And with that, I'll open it up to questions from the media. Riley Johnson with a question for Director Lopez. Hi, Riley. Director Lopez will be right up. Hi, Mayor. Good afternoon, Riley. Hi, Pat. Um, can you give a little more specifics about the circumstances of the latest death report? Were they a hospitalized case for a long period of time? They weren't hospitalized for a long t period of time, but they were hospitalized. And they were a known case, correct? Yes. And um, of the four deaths that have been reported in the county so far, ha have those folks, to your knowledge, had underlying health conditions? or um, And can you speak to just generally when you're reporting a death from COVID-19, what you need to have in hand to do that? In general, uh, well, to report a death, um, we actually, the health department signs the death certificates uh, for the city of Lincoln and Lancaster County. So we have the death certificate um, in hand before we announce the death, but generally when they occur in our hospital systems or there's an EMS involvement, we're notified that way or with the count by the county attorney. But um, all of the, the deaths we have reported to date have been individuals that have been hospitalized and have uh, underlying health conditions. Director Lopez, this is Bill. Before you leave, I have a quick question for you on um, 28 days uh, being symptom-free versus 14 days being symptom-free and, and kind of why that distinction was made. Can you repeat that, Bill? Yeah, we have heard some people say you, you're recovered after 14 days. You guys are saying after 28 days, 
just wanting you to elaborate on the distinction and why for full weeks. We, we do that because um, the CDC definition for recovery is too negative available. And so the other option, go back to go individuals, back to individuals in, 28 in 28 days. This is the same standard that's being used in Omaha and across other health departments. So there's consistency in how we determine a recovery. after the first on of symptoms. Okay, thank you. And uh, one more note, Lee, I, I think I misspoke. You know, one of our individuals was an EMS call that was taken to the hospital. Thank you. Uh, a question for the mayor. Hi, Hi Mayor. Um, could you address some of the early efforts um, sort of to do outreach from the city and the health department to the um, cultural centers and, um, and sort of working on that um, problem of uh, some people, English is a second language. Yes. Um, yes. From the very beginning, we were laser focused on trying to make sure that we got information out to those who may have barriers to accessing the most timely and important public health messages. So in the early days, that looked like getting the recommendations from the CDC translated and distributed through our cultural centers. Uh, it included uh, convening our cultural community leaders, and I can let um, Director Lopez speak more to the what those meetings have entailed over time. But we've also um, met to try to understand uh, their requests and their concerns and during an initial conversation I had with cultural community leaders we determined that filming PSAs using city communications tech and video uh, tech, uh, resources would be one way that we could shoot videos of leaders from each cultural center who wanted to participate and then distribute those over social media so that people were getting messages from leaders they recognized, people um, who could speak their languages, in, and we shot those videos in multiple languages. And then, of course, we did, um, as well, social media graphics in a variety of languages uh, with an emphasis on uh, Spanish, Arabic, and Vietnamese, because those are the three most spoken languages after English, but we also did them in others. And then, uh, of course, trying to understand how we could remove any barriers to access to testing, whether they're economic or cultural, and making sure that um, that we have testing going on in the community, uh, in places where people will be able to access it easily. Um, and so that's part of what you see represented by the effort at Lincoln High this Friday. Uh, that's free testing site, Friday from 4 to 7 p.m. And we do ask people to register in advance through their local cultural center or through our health department. Um, so these are among the efforts that we have undertaken. And um, I know uh, Director Lopez could probably share a little more about the kind of convenings that the health department has done week to week to make sure that we are addressing needs. Riley, Riley we, have, we have a long history at the health department of working with our cultural centers on um, many different areas, especially those that relate to adverse health outcomes and um, the social determinants of health. And so we've worked collaboratively together on many opportunities. We've sought funding together. Um, we've developed plans that we've implemented and combined resources. So it was really a really natural um, process for us to be in, again convening. Sometimes we are together weekly via Zoom uh, to talk about what the needs are. Um, we were able to work with them and talk from each center's perspective, learning uh, about what, what their, their members are experiencing in the community and following their direction about how we can best address those. So I think what helped us in our community is that we have a longstanding relationship of working together at the health department, but also through many other city agencies. Um, and that's one of the best things about being in Lincoln. Uh, even though we're a larger community, we're still like a small, a small town. Pat, a follow-up. Um, Friday's uh, 
Friday's drive through test site at Lincoln High. What, what, what's the capacity that you'll have to test and how many do you hope to test? Well, we're testing from four to seven. Um, we have a target capacity of 150. But we really want people um, who have um, a need, if they're having any symptoms, to please call us and we'll work through that process. We want everyone who needs a test to be able to have a test in an environment that feels comfortable to them and with those there uh, that may be able to provide interpretation services if that's necessary. Now, are you able to elaborate on how many people have signed up in the first 24 hours and if there's still plenty of room left? Bill, there's still plenty of room left. I don't have the exact number, but I kind of saw a list as I was walking out the door. But remember, the other thing is cultural center individuals are signing people up. We're signing people up at the health department. So we'll be combining that tomorrow. Director Lopez, do you have a, um, do you have any sort of sense for the um, outbreak in Crete? Uh, are, there, are there more tests that are still pending um, that you're waiting to see back on or, um, you know, have have those string of exposures your contact traces tracers have identified? Have they um, have they reached an end point? We're still uh, waiting on some additional test results to come in, and I'll be uh, having a call with the health director at Public Health Solutions tomorrow to reevaluate where we're at in the process. Just a couple of quick follow ups and some of the questions um, we you know, are operating in a unified command structure, which involves multiple departments meeting every day to talk about how they can collaborate to help serve on our priorities for the day and the week. And um, just today, LTU was offering up and, and um, clarifying that they would be available to support traffic at Lincoln High if needed. Uh, our transportation utilities folks are used to managing traffic and uh, are part of that on Friday be successful. So that's something to keep in mind. And then with regard to additional resources for our residents, um, available information translated into multiple languages available on our covid19.lincoln.ne.gov website. If you click on resident resources, there are uh, available links to information, again, in Arabic, Spanish, Vietnamese, and many other languages. And we're using Google Translate on the website as well to, to provide additional uh, translation as needed for residents as they need to seek important, accurate, timely information that will help protect them and their loved ones and our community. Any other questions? Mayor, has the city given any more thought to the governor's June 1st and June 18th dates for youth baseball and softball and, and whether the city will be following that policy as well? Right. Uh, the governor's statewide directed health measure um, states that no team uh, organized team sports and practices or games are, are allowed through May 31st, and that means no team organized training, practice, or group exercise program. So I just want to clarify through May 31st, that's still the, the case. And then we've looked at what, what does the city do with Parks and Rec? They do not offer youth baseball or softball. Our understanding, though, is that adult, spart, uh, adult sports will not be allowed to resume through the state-directed health measure. So in accordance with that, we do not plan on offering adult softball programming this summer. Um, but Parks and Rec is now working with our health department on plans for the operation of ball fields, because while we do not provide youth programming in baseball and softball, we do provide field space for rent. So um, at this time, um, the health department is working with Parks and Rec because they do agree that these sports are not a high risk activity given that they're outdoors and can be achieved with physical distancing uh, guidelines. But they wanna emphasize that team sponsors and organizers and coaches will have to be incredibly vigilant and adhere to the statewide guidelines that will be issued to make this possible. You know, the contact Frequency and the contact duration and distance are all key concerns that health officials take into consideration when they're making their recommendations. And baseball and softball are generally 
low to medium risk on both of on these factors. Um, and there is, of course, potential to modify those situations where contact may occur. So, for example, if there are rules added that prevent sliding into bases, that, that greatly reduces the potential for collision between two players, which is something we want to, of course, avoid having physical contact. So I think there's just a lot of thoughtful guidance that's going to need to be provided and adhered to by everyone who, who wants to make this work. Um, we know that organizations and coaches and players and parents are, are really excited about the news for the potential resumption of softball and baseball. Um, but we do want to encourage everyone to be a part of helping in this effort to keep our community safe. It's, in, it's anticipated that there will be additional guidance from the state um, on how to do this safely. Uh, and we want to make sure everyone is consulting that guidance. Um, the park department has online reservations for practice fields. And so those will become available two weeks in advance of, of the desired date. Um, reservations for practice time will be available on Monday, May 18th for times on June 1st. And that online reserv reservation system for practice fields is at parks.lincoln.ne.gov. Thank you for that clarification, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the media? Okay. Well, thank you for tuning into this briefing. Thank you for everything that everyone in Lincoln and Lancaster County is doing to keep themselves and their loved ones, our neighbors, and community safe. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 3.30.